In this video, we're going to look at how we can actually install the common set of developer tools on our Windows workstation. The tools that we're looking at are listed here. This is a common set of developer tools that are great to get started or on your development workstation. And again, if you have other alternatives, for example, if you have a different text editor or IDE that you like, that's fantastic. This will just give you a starting point should you need one to go through. With that, we're going to dive into the hands-on portion where we can set up our Windows workstation as a development environment. We'll be installing this basic set of tools on our platform. Let's get to it. All right, here we are. I'm logged into a Windows 10 workstation, and we're going to use this to install all of the development tools that we've talked about. Now, as I look, what I've opened up here is our DevNet Learning Labs module on developer workstation and environment setup. In this video, we're going to walk through the lab, setting up our Windows workstation as a development environment. If I go ahead and click the button to start that lab, we'll go ahead and get me going through. Now, if you've done uh, DevNet Learning Labs before, you're probably familiar with the interface. But if you haven't, if this is your first time, what we have is over here on the left-hand side, a navigation panel that shows me the different steps that are involved. And then the text of the lab is here in the middle. So we're going to walk through each of the steps, going through all of the pieces necessary to set up this Windows workstation as a development environment. And as I get going, we can see what our objective is to install the workstations, and we can see some basic prerequisites. Now the idea here, one thing to keep in mind, outside of just having a Windows 10 environment, is we'll be installing software onto our workstation. That means we need administrative credentials to log into this workstation. If you're on an enterprise computer and you don't have admin credentials, you may need to talk with your IT professionals to make sure that you can get access to do this. All right, before that, or with that under the way, let's go ahead and get started. Moving on to our second step, we are on Windows-specific preparation. Now, there isn't anything specific we have to do other than having a Windows workstation to go in. This is a, basically a step holder, uh, placeholder step for other uh, pieces that are necessary on Mac and Linux workstations. Moving along to source control systems, we can see we're going to install Git for our source control system. Our steps here to navigate off to here to get our download. Now I've already downloaded all of the packages necessary for each of these steps to my workstation to speed ourselves up here. And I can see that I've got the Git installation that's there. So I'm gonna go back to the learning lab and we can see that we wanna go ahead and run this application. I'll go ahead and say, yep, I do wanna run that indeed and I get my, nav or my typical Windows installation. Now, if we look over here at the Learning Lab, we can see that we wanna run the, the downloaded installer and take the defaults with the following considerations. We may wanna check the box to add additional icons on the desktop, and then also changing the default text editor to another option if we have one available. For example, if you've got Notepad++, you can use that instead. So let's go ahead and tackle this. We'll take the defaults, the location, Here's that additional icons. I do want to see the additional icons on the desktop, make it easier to work with it. And then we're going to go ahead and continue through. <clears throat> now, in this case, I'll go ahead and keep Vim. I don't have Notepad++ installed, but you could certainly pick one of these other ones that are there. I'll go ahead and use Vim. The rest of these defaults will be perfect. And that's it. It's going to go ahead and get us installed as we go through. All right, here we can see that our installation is completed successfully. I can go ahead and launch Git Bash right away if I wanted to, and we've got the option to view the release notes. I don't necessarily need to see the release notes, so we'll close that, and I'm not gonna launch it automatically. We'll see how we can do that um, by default. So I'll finish that off. Now to verify that the Git was completed, or the Git installation worked successfully, we wanna follow this verification step in the Learning Lab. It says open Git Bash, you can use the desktop or start menu shortcut, and then from within the command, run git dash dash version to see what we've got. So let's go ahead and check that out. So here under the start menu, I can see that if I just type git, there we go. So here we've got git bash. I'll go ahead and open that up. And now we'll talk more about git bash in just a second on the shell section, but we'll just follow the examples here that the lab says. So the first one is git dash dash version, git dash dash version. And indeed, I did get back Git version. Looks like it's a little bit newer than the one that was in the lab. No big deal there. And now let's try to clone down a repository from GitHub. I'm gonna practice copy and paste. So we'll go ahead and we'll copy that. And we will paste this. And so what git clone does is actually copies down a repository from GitHub into my local directory. 
and we've seen that that successfully matches what I expected, so git is working successfully, and we finished this one correctly. Go ahead and close git bash now, and we'll move on to terminals and shells. Now here in terminals and shells, what we're focusing on is getting a bash interface, and bash is the default terminal on Linux and Mac OS and Unix workstations, and as we can see, git bash is, was installed along with git in our last step. We actually already opened it up once. So let's go ahead and go back in and take a look at that. Reopen git bash. And if I do a uh, ls, we can see that I have my hello network repository, which is what we cloned on before. So we'll change into that directory. So cd into hello network. And then if I do an ls-l, we can see that there is a hello network.sh. That's a bash script. Let's see if our bash terminal is working as expected by running it. So dot slash hello network.sh. The dot py is a Python hello network script. We run this and we can see that we expect, as expected, we got back hello network. So it does indeed look like our bash terminal is working as expected. Moving on to programming languages. And so for programming languages, what we're going to tackle is Python first. So Python gives us this ability where... Now for programming languages, we're going to look at both Python and Node as we talked about in the last video. Here, starting with Python, we're going to install two versions, the Python 2.7.14 as well as Python 3.6. And as before, I've already downloaded or uh, done these downloads for me, but let's see where they look, where, where we would find them. So if I navigate to this link, we can see that right here at the top, I've got the latest Python 3 release, Python 3.6.5, and then the 2.7.15. If I click on one of these and scroll down, I can see the download files for all the different platforms. What I downloaded here was this Windows x86-64 MSI installer. And then in a second, we'll do Python 3.6, and we'll see where that one is. If I look at the Python 3.6 and scroll down, we can see that I downloaded this one here the Windows x86-64 executable installer. So I've downloaded both of those and have them available over here, 2.7 and 3.6.5. So if we go back to our steps, we'll start out with the Python 2.7 installation. All right. Now what we want to tackle here is we will install this for all users is fine. And now there is an important piece we need to look at. All right, we'll start out by installing the latest version of Python 2.7. We can see in here that it was actually 2.7.14 when the lab was written, but we downloaded 2.7.15. No big deal, just slightly newer. We'll have all of the same capabilities. We'll install this for all users, and we'll take the default directory of C Python 2.7, or Python 27 without the dot in there. Now in here, one of the things that we need to look for, as noted in here, is this under the customized Python 2.7, we need to add Python exe to path. So if I scroll down, we can see this option. Now this is really important to make sure that we install this. This will make it much easier to run Python from a command line interpreter by adding it to path. The path is again just the, the list of directories that our workstation will search for when we type a command. Go ahead and click on next, accept that we'll install this. All right, our installation is finished, and I'm going to go ahead and just click that Finish button there. And then moving right along in our learning lab, we'll see that next is our Python 3.6.5. Now, we've already downloaded it, so we want to go ahead and do our installation. So I've got my Python 3.6.5. We'll double-click on this one. Now here, we still need to do the Add Python to Path, but rather than being on the Customize screen, it's right here, this checkbox at the bottom. So I'm going to check the box to Add Python 3.6 to Path. And then we will go ahead and do our install now. All right, this installation is finished, so we'll go ahead and close that off. Moving down here, we can see we're at the verification step for Python 2 and Python 3. Now, one of the things that we've done here is we did make changes to the path variable inside of Windows. So we definitely need to open up a new git bash terminal. But as there's a note here, occasionally you may need to restart your computer to check it that it's fully functioning. So let's close the old git bash window that we had and open up a new one.
All right, let's see if we're working. So py-3 dash capital V gives us Python 365. That's good. Let's see if Python 2 is working. py-2 dash capital V gives me Python 2715. Now, if you've used Python before and are not familiar with this py, what py is is Python Launcher. This is included with Python for 3 for Windows because of the lack of built-in alias support. With a Unix or Linux-based system, you have the ability to use Python and uh, point that at different types of versions. Windows doesn't have anything quite the same, which is why the Python launcher gives us the ability to use py-3 or py-2 to specify versions that are specific that are there. We can look at the default version of Python by just doing python-v, and we can see that the default version of Python here is 2.7.15. Now there's a bit of final Python setup. We want to make sure that we're in good shape. And this is for Python virtual environments as we go through here. A Python virtual environment is an isolated environment where we can specify exactly which Python version as well as what modules and environments that we want there. So let's go ahead and tackle this and see how it goes through. Now with Python 3, we'll go ahead and tackle do this using the commands. So we'll do py-3-m for module. Now we want to then create a virtual environment called py3-venv. This command takes just a few seconds to run and it is creating that Python virtual environment. Once the command completes, we activate our virtual environment using the source command. So we do source py3venv and then on Windows machines, it's scripts is our next directory and then it's activate. When we type that, we know that we've activated it successfully because now our prompt includes py3 ve and v in there. Now the key reason why we do this is to change which version of Python we're using with default. Now before when we looked at Python dash capital V we saw that we were on 2715. Now when I do Python dash capital V we can see that I'm on 365 because I built a virtual environment dedicated for Python 365. So everything is looking good for that one. We'll deactivate to deactivate this virtual environment and go back to normal. And once again, if I do Python dash capital V, we can see that I'm back to 2715. Now the virtual environment that we just created was for Python 3. We may want to be able to do that for Python 2 as well. So let's go ahead and tackle that. Before we create a virtual environment, we actually need to have access to a, the virtual environment library for Python 2. It's not included by default like it was with Python 3. We install that with pip, which is included. So py-2-m, pip, that's our Python package module, install virtual env. This will download virtual env from PyPy, which is where we host all of the packages, and install it for us. Once it's been installed, now I can use it to create my Python 2 virtual environment. So py-2-m, our module this time is virtual env, the one we just installed, and then py2-venv to create our Python 2 virtual environment. With the virtual environment command completed, now we can activate it once again with our source command, py2-venv, scripts, activate, and I'm grabbing that from right here in the learning lab. We run that, and now we can see that we're in the py2 venv, and if I do python dash capital V, we can see that we are at python 2715 for this virtual environment. We will then deactivate this virtual environment, Now moving along, now we're going to go ahead and install Node. Node is a, the Node JavaScript framework if we want to build and work with Node applications. So again, we'll navigate to our downloads file. And we'll see here that we've got the Windows installer and it's been downloaded here, Node v811. Going back to our lab, it says, okay, we want to run the downloaded installer taking all the defaults. So we'll go ahead and run the installer. Okay, the installer's opened up. We'll go ahead and run through these steps. Next, we'll accept the license. We'll say, yep, we definitely want to install. Okay, node is finished installing. Now, 
whenever you install a new piece of software, it's always a good idea to close and reopen our terminal. So we'll close git bash, we will open a new one, and we will do our test and verification that it worked. What we want to type here is node-v, and we can see that we're on version 11.1, .1, as expected. Moving along to text editors and IDEs, in this case we're going to install the Atom text editor and IDE. Now, as I've mentioned several times, if you have a preferred text editor or IDE, feel free to use it, but if you don't, Atom is a great choice. We navigate to the atom.io page, we can see downloads right there in the middle, and I have indeed already downloaded it. We'll go ahead and we will run the downloaded installer and take all of the defaults. Once Adam finishes installing, it will automatically open the first time, and it will present you with this registration question, question for different uh, the Adam colon slash slash URI handler. I recommend just hitting yes always, and so if you do see a URI that comes through in a link for Adam colon slash slash, it'll automatically open up the Adam editor here for us. That's it to get it installed. Now we can move on to development tools and clients. There are a few different tools that we'll install. The first one will be Postman. We navigate to Get Postman Apps here is where we would find the download. And we can choose our platform. I have an indeed downloaded the Postman Windows one in advance. We'll go ahead and install that, again, taking all of the defaults. Now once Postman installation finishes, it will open up and present you with this screen. It gives you the ability to sign up or sign in if you already have an account. Now Postman gives you the ability to create a free account to let you save different settings across platforms. You don't need an account to use it. You can simply click this button at the bottom, take me straight to the app. This will then open up and bring you to the Postman interface. Now, If we want to verify that it's working, I can scroll down here and we can make a really quick, fun REST API call with Postman for the dad joke API. So to do this, we're going to grab this URL and I will copy that over here into, the, uh, into Postman. We need to add a quick entry for the accept type header to specify what type of data we're after. So accept, and we want application JSON. With that done, we can go ahead and click the send button and enjoy a fun little joke. I've tried taking some high resolution photos of local farmland, but they all turned out a bit grainy. I love it when the dad jokes also have a bit of tech to them. All right, we'll go ahead and close down Postman. We've got it working for us and move on to our next piece, which is ngrok. Now, ngrok, again, this enables us to build local connection tunnels from our development workstation to the internet to test things like chat bots and other services. We'll navigate to the ngrok downloads page and do our download for Windows. Again, I've already done that. Now, the next step here is simply to extract ngrok from the, um, the zip file that we download. So we'll open this up we can see that we want to go ahead and extract that. We will extract all. Now to make it easy to use it, I'm recommending we, in, we extract this right into our home directory. So we're going to go ahead and pull this back. We'll delete all those pieces and we'll just say extract it to wrong slash and grok. And extract. And we can see that it is indeed now there and available. Now to verify that this is working, we're going to go ahead and open up a command shell. Now we do, we have to use the command shell on Windows. Ngrok will not start correctly from git bash. So we will open up a command prompt. So cmd. Now have a command shell and we will change into our ngrok directory. And Grok, and we will type ngrok http 5000. 
you're not sure what NGROC is doing in this case, don't worry about it. We're just making sure that it's working for us. And in labs that actually use it, there'll be explanations about what it's doing. What we see here is what's expected. And we have indeed started a new NGROC session. And we could actually reach our local workstation on port 5000 by navigating to one of these forwarding addresses. We don't actually have any code running and listening on port 5000, so we wouldn't get anything if we tried. But it is working. Can now press Control C to end the NGROC session that's there. We don't need the command window anymore. I'll go ahead and close that. Now, Google Chrome is a great web browser to use. It's actually the one I've been using here in these examples. But one of the reasons to use it as a development tool is because of the developer tools that are there. If you don't already have it installed, you can download it from google.com slash chrome. So if I navigate to that, we can see that we can download Chrome. I've already downloaded it and installed Chrome. Many users seem to already have it installed. But if you haven't, that's how you could get it. Now to verify that the tools are working as expected, what we want to look for here is those three dots in the corner, and we want to turn on the developer tools. I'll click the three dots, more tools, developer tools. What this gives me is this new tab that pops up with a whole series of different things that we can use to navigate and understand exactly, let me make the screen a bit bigger here. So we can use these developer tools to understand how um, the web windows and how the different pieces are going through there. As long as, let me scroll up a little bit. As long as you see this terminal has popped up as you go through on there, you're in good shape and we're ready to go. You can close the developer tools just by clicking the close button there. Now the next piece we want to look at is Open Connect. Open Connect is for those that may not already have a Cisco AnyConnect client installed and need a VPN client to connect to the different DevNet sandboxes. Open Connect is an open source version of an SSL VPN client. So if I go to the Open Connect GUI or releases page, this is where we would download it. We can see the Open Connect GUI 1.5.3 for Windows. I've already downloaded that as before. And we want to go ahead and install that. Now, if we look at what we need to do here, we want to, on the Install Options page, add the Open Connect GUI to the system path for all users. That makes it really easy to work with. And then also on Install Options, we want to create the Open Connect GUI desktop icon. So let's go ahead and get that done. All right, we'll go ahead and click Next and Agree. And here's that the Install Options page. So we want to add Open Connect GUI to the system path for all users, and we also want to create the desktop icon so we can find it. Go ahead and click on Next for that. And taking the rest of the defaults. Now, part of the Open Connect um, software is installing the VPN drivers necessary for this, so we do need to install those as they come through. Okay, we'll go ahead and finish this, and we'll see it go. The, I check the box to start it, and this opens up the VPN client. Now, for a verification for this, we would need a place to connect to. You can easily go reserve a different DevNet um, sandbox out of the catalog, and as part of grabbing one of our reservable sandboxes, you would be emailed the VPN credentials. The way you would use those would be to create a new profile, and then use the VPN address as the gateway and save and connect. Don't have one of those set up, but we can we can look at where they would be. So, new profile. And we would put in our, the, um, the VPN address as our gateway that was there. And then save and connect would then prompt you for the username and password. And you would be connected and ready to go. Now our final piece to install here is the application container engine Docker. In this case, we'll be installing Docker for Windows. Now a couple of notes about Docker for Windows. Docker for Windows on Windows 10 leverages the Hyper-V features that are embedded inside of Windows 10 um, and you need to enable those before you install Docker for Windows. This also means that in order to install Docker for Windows, you need to be installing it onto an uh, into an environment that supports Hyper-V. This sometimes limits the ability to install Docker for Windows onto virtual machines. In this case, I've actually moved from a virtual machine that I was using for the previous steps to my laptop because my virtual machine does not support Hyper-V running on it. Let's make sure the Hyper-V feature is turned on on my laptop. I'll go into Features. And then here in the Windows Features section, I need to make sure that the Hyper-V tools are turned on, Hyper-V Management as well as Platform. And they're both enabled. 
Now, if they're not installed already, you can go ahead and check those and turn them on. It will require a reboot. Now, one note that we have here, I've got it highlighted here even in the Learning Lab. While the Hyper-V features are enabled on Windows 10, any other hypervisor platform, like a VirtualBox or VMware Workstation, will not work. This is because the Hyper-V feature capability of the platform is grabbing the, um, the virtualization features of the CPU and leveraging them for Hyper-V. You can't have more than one hypervisor working at the same time. So I'll go ahead and click on Cancel. I didn't make any changes. And to download those is from docker.com for the community editions. We can see get docker CE from docker store. And then we need docker for windows. So we want to go ahead and grab docker community edition and then get docker. I've already downloaded it here on the side. So we'll go ahead and we will run the installation taking all the defaults. And we can see here I actually already had it installed and it's showing that it's up to date. If you're doing a fresh installation, it would go ahead and just finish that for you to make sure you're in good shape. Now to verify that it's functioning, we'll go back to git bash and we'll just run a quick Docker container. So Docker run busybox, which is a basic little Docker container that goes through. So it starts and stop and shows no output. Let's see if it actually worked by running docker ps-a to list all of the Docker containers and images, including ones that have stopped. And indeed that I can see here that 12 seconds ago, I had my busy box that started up and went. So Docker is indeed working as expected. Now if we move ahead to the summary page, we can see that we're all done as we've gone through here. You've now fully prepared your Windows workstation as a development environment, and you're ready to explore different DevNet learning labs that are out there.